down the keyboard or up and down the, you know, the scales of the musical instrument. You don't actually do that in a real concert, but you need to be able to do those same kinds of moves, right? So there's that element of this too that you know these techniques are good in that they get you thinking about fundamentals, um, you know, sequences of, of events and transitions, uh, weird stuff that really shouldn't happen, but maybe it could happen, and we should understand what what happens next. You know, so I think there's a I think there's, there's a benefit of that too, just forcing yourself to think through the, the fundamentals of it. Um, another question that came up previously was the use of reactive strategies like exploratory testing or bug hunting in the context of, of these techniques. And that's certainly something you can do. You know, if you're running one of these state-based tests and you see something weird happen, then you know, by all means, like, go off and explore the, the weirdness. You know, don't go, oh, well, you know, the next thing I'm supposed to do is this. So I can't. I can't go look at that, you know. I mean, anytime you see something strange happen, you want to explore it. So uh, certainly these techniques are, uh, are combinable in, in that way. Uh, let's see what we got, uh, got here. The question and answer pane up from the audience. Um, I got a question here from George Carter. Um, where your data seems to compare the actions taken by one state with actions taken by others, many times it's difficult to gather this data. In these instances, where do you obtain the source data, compare the actions, and derive a better action plan? Um, okay, so this seems to get to the issue of this is all well and good if somebody gives you a state transition diagram, but what do you do if you don't have the state transition diagram, right? Um, well, let's assume that you're developing your tests in, in context that would be the case, say, here at CA to start with, where you do have access to the programmers, right, and the designers. <laughs> so if if you have access to those folks, then presumably you can draw the diagram. You can show that to the designer or programmer and say, I think this is how this system is supposed to work. And you confirm this and you can walk through it with them. Right? And if that's incorrect, then they suggest changes and you make those changes and then you've got the basis for your test. Now, um, if you don't have access to those folks, then maybe you have access to user's guides, um, online help, something like that, in which case you could possibly derive the diagrams from the text. Now, that's, uh, that's not necessarily going to be 100% every time. But, you know, in a lot of cases, it will work. So, for example, the, the diagram that I showed you for the e-commerce application, I, I derived that just from observation of how our website worked, right? And similarly, you know, those of you who are working on backup systems here, I would think you could just, from common sense, figure out, okay, well, these, these are how these things work. You know, these are the different states that they can be in. So the... The diagram might be something that you create, and then you expand it as your understanding of the application evolves. In that case, it just it becomes a tool that helps you create test cases and not forget things. Right? Obviously, it's nice if these are given to you as part of the system design specification or something. But you know, maybe maybe you get them, maybe you don't. Uh, let's see, we've got a question here from Rich Agnello. Um, is the state transition model best designed within the system or UAT context of the V model for clients desiring end to end validation? Can we define systems across the unit or, or define states across the unit or system integration topology? 
Um, I don't think there's any real intersection between the level of testing you're doing and whether this model, this technique works or not. So, for example, I mean, if you're testing a unit, then you could talk about the states that a given class uh, or object could take on. Um, if you're testing integration testing or running integration tests, then seems like the system could be in various states depending on communications that are happening or data flows that are happening. So I don't think there is that limitation of you know, this is a technique that applies primarily at the higher levels. That is the case for use case testing in most cases because use case testing is an end-to-end -end kind of test. So it's particularly applicable to system tests and system integration tests and user acceptance tests, but not so much for unit testing. But for uh, state models, no. I mean, I think those those can apply at different levels. Um, <clears throat> question from uh, Mike Ellis: Can this fit into an agile method? Um, sure. Uh, no reason why not. Though I would expect that if you're doing agile testing in an agile situation you want to minimize your documentation so you might just have the diagram and state transition table and the switch table and just generate your tests on the fly from those without actually having them documented. Anybody has questions here you just jump in and make a point. Just reading them off the panel here. Um, that's a question for Dave. Do organizations using state-based techniques consult with development in order to validate the states? Uh, more of a white box approach or is a black box approach preferred in order to retain objectivity as from a user's point of view? Um, I would think that if you've got the development team available to you, you should talk to them about the diagram. Show, show your diagram to them and have them um, comment on it. I wouldn't necessarily say validate in the sense of they get to approve or reject the diagram, right? I mean, if, if they say, well, this can't be because of this or this or that, then you're still free to say, well, I don't, I don't believe those reasons. I'm still going to try it, right? If you've created the diagram, it's a tool for you to create tests. But uh, certainly in any circumstance where you can gather input from the programmers and the designers, I think that's a good thing to do. I know I've, I've, I've heard these, this argument about don't talk to the programmers, don't talk to the developers, designers, because that'll compromise your objectivity. But I, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the case. You gain new information from them. It's always better as a tester to know more of that rather than less. Um, <laughs> you know, Mephistopheles happens to be one of your developers. You're worried about being turned to the dark side or something. Um, <laughs> uh, Dave Orleans, uh, the guy with the previous question, responds, he is. So, um, uh, Dave, if, if you smell sulfur when one of the developers comes around the corner, then that's the guy not to talk to. So. <laughs> you hear the clatter of a cloven hoof on the, the, uh, on the tile. Um, okay, any other questions here? You guys? Yeah. Yeah, so how, how far to take the switch coverage? Um, well, let's say, let's suppose that you, that you like the idea of covering sequences of transitions and you want to extend that out indefinitely. Would you use that model to do it? No. What you would do is you'd use some, something that's often called a dumb monkey which is a random, automated random test tool that is able to traverse things like menu 